Um, I want to welcome everyone to to Philip Musher's um, thesis defense. Um, I'll say I'll say a, just a couple of words as as introduction. Um, so Philip Philip joined my group um, as a as a joint student between myself and Professor Will Chu. Um, I think it was late in 2016, um, and and it has been a a, a really great honor. I want to say to have played just some small part in in the research that that Philip will present here today. He, he really led this effort, I think, from start to finish and, and took my research group in, in new directions that I think is going to influence um, our work into the future. Uh, one thing I think that I was trying to think about some things that, that really characterizes Philip and, and, and makes him unique. And one thing that, that comes to mind really soon, really quickly is his desire to, to do things right, to understand every aspect of his work and, and do science in, in the correct way. Uh, I remember I was bugging him a couple of years ago to try to get this paper out. Uh, and you know I, I was saying, well, there are always some things that we won't understand. That's how science works. Uh, we got to get this paper published before this deadline and so on. Um, and, and to his credit, he really pushed back. Uh, and the end product that you're going to hear today, I think, is, is really far better uh, as a result. So I have a tremendous amount of respect for him and his approach to science. And I think you're all about to learn something uh, really interesting. Um, so I don't know, Will, if you want to say uh, a couple of words as well. Thank you, Aaron. And um, I will echo exactly the same thing. I think one of Philip's uh, greatest qualities is that he is a perfectionist. Uh, nothing less was, uh, will, will be fine for him. And just like Aaron, I have you know, pushed him to finish things. And you know, I've actually asked Philip to do, stop doing experiments, actually. I think Aaron may also have the same experience as well, but he always defies us and does the experiments anyway, and then come back and tell us, yeah, we learned something quite a bit more and or the previous uh, results are not complete. Um, so I think I just want to mention this to all the students out there that, you know, sometimes in your head, you're doing a cost benefit analysis, like is this extra effort going to be worth it? And I think Philip's approach is, well, let the science guide it. You know, if you're curious, if you want to be perfect, you just have to do it. Um, I think this is kind of a fleeting quality in science these days and uh, couldn't be more proud um, to be also learning from Philip on that. I think he's really setting an exceptionally high standard uh, for everyone here um, in the department at the university. So thank you very much, Philip. Yeah, yeah and you should take it away. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. So let me share my screen. Um, Yeah, so also thank you to everyone who made it out here. I think um, we have people joining from three different continents. So thank you so much for being here. Um, so the title of my defense talk is Dynamical Switching of a 2D Material via Ion Insertion. And in this talk, I will show you how ion insertion can be used as a new technique to dynamically switch the properties of 2D materials. So the control over material properties has always shaped what humans were able to do. So access to materials with better properties has shaped progress in terms of survival, but also improving, improving the quality of life. Um, that, that humans had. So for that reason, the prehistoric ages are named after the main material that has been used for tool making at these times. So Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age. And even in modern times, um, innovations in materials shape what we can do. So innovation in glass and concrete has allowed the revolution of urbanization, and then um, progress in working with silicon has enabled the digitalization revolution. So of course, if we look at any of these materials, um, how like the properties of these materials fundamentally are defined by the atomic structure of the materials. So at atomic length scales, we usually find an ordered atomic arrangements 
where atomic bond lengths, for example, define the properties of the material. But atomic time scales are also important. So it turns out that in all of these materials, um, we have well-defined collective atomic vibrations, which shape properties as well. For example, the thermal properties of the materials. So of course, we have learned to engineer and control material properties. So one way to do it is in a static way, for example, to lock in properties during synthesis. And an example for that is sword making. So this swordsmith um, has, has decided which materials to start out with as precursors and has decided to use elevated temperature and elevated pressure to lock in a certain set of material properties that are desirable. However, for modern applications, dynamic modulation of material properties is becoming increasingly important. And this can be done, for example, by applying electric fields that change over time to the material. So in this work, I will talk about how we can use iron insertion to dynamically modulate material properties. So with iron insertion, we can tune the atomic arrangement on atomic length scales and on atomic time scales, we can tune the vibrations. So iron insertion um, can be done with a set, with a, with a large group of materials. So some examples are shown over here. So you can see there's a variety of host structures that we can use. And there's also a variety of ions that can be inserted. For example, in this case, hydrogen, lithium, and oxygen. And these, this insertion drives changes to the properties um, that can be divided up in two ways. So first is it drives chemical transformations, which are used in applications, for example, lithium ion batteries. However, um, ion insertion also drives changes to the physical properties, which we can therefore dynamically switch by inserting ions and removing them again. So ions modulate how the material interacts with photons. This is used in electrochromic windows where the transmission of light can be modulated by using ion insertion. We can also use ion insertion to modulate how the material interacts with electrons, which can be used for memory devices. And ions can also modulate how the material interacts with phonons, which modulates the thermal properties of the material. So you can see there's a rich set of both material systems that we can use and a rich set of potential applications of this technique. So with this background, I want to come back to the title of my talk, Dynamic Switching of 2D Material via Ion Insertion. And I'll break up that title for you. So with dynamic switching, I mean reversibly changing the physical properties on fast timescales that are fast enough to be technologically relevant. With 2D materials, I'm talking about a class of materials um, that are made up of stacked two-dimensional layers. And these materials feature unique functional properties. Therefore, these properties are well worth of modulating and controlling. And when I say ion insertion, I'm talking about the controlled and reversible insertion of ionic species into a host lattice, while that lattice retains its overall structure. So a layered material remains a layered material after iron insertion. So the key contributions of this work to the field of iron insertion are as follows. First, um, I'm investigating how the iron-induced switching actually happens on both atomic length and atomic time scales. And I'm investigating this in individual microscale particles. Um, as opposed to, for example, um, investigating a powder form material where all the properties are sort of averaged out in all the directions. And I'm also introducing 
a new application um, from iron insertion, which is highly efficient mechanical actuation. So now I'd like to give you an outline of my talk. So first, I will introduce the material system that we'll be studying. Um, it's called tungsten ditelluride. Then I will introduce the experimental platform that is being used throughout this talk, which allows the use of electrochemistry to control the insertion and removal of ions from tungsten ditelluride. Then I will talk about an ion-induced phase transition that leads to an exotic atomic arrangement. Then I will talk about how can we modulate that exotic atomic arrangement by changing the concentration of lithium in the material. Then I will talk about how ions can modulate the vibrational properties of the material. And finally, I will talk about ion insertion kinetics, which define whether or not these processes are actually occurring fast enough to be useful for applications. So let me start with the material system. So our material system is part of the group of transition metal dichalcogenides. So these materials, the structure of them is shown on the right-hand side. Um, we have these covalently bound layers where in the middle we have a plane of transition metals flanked by planes of cal calcogen atoms. And in between these covalently bound layers, we have a gap where we only have a Van der Waals force. So this is called the Van der Waals gap. And these materials have remarkable properties which lead to promising applications, for example, in the field of nanoelectronics. And um, ion insertion has already been demonstrated in these material systems. So ions can be inserted in these in this Van der Waals gap between the layers. And then for the example of molybdenum disulfide, which is shown over here, we see a transition from the semiconducting to the metallic state. We see changed optical properties, as you can see on the bottom right, where um, the color of the material changes as ions are inserted from uh, towards the edges of the material. Um, we see changed vibrational properties, which in turn lead to a one order of magnitude reduction of the thermal conductance of the material with lithium ion insertion. And then in, in many of these materials, lattice expansions have been observed and phase transitions have been observed due to ion insertion. So in this talk, I'll be talking, I'll be looking at tungsten ditelluride, which is a unique transition metal dichalcogenide. So the structure of this material is shown on the right-hand side. And it's a highly anisotropic structure because we have these one-dimensional zigzag tungsten chains. And this structure leads to a broken inversion symmetry, which in turn is linked to remarkable properties of the material. So this is a topological semi-metal, which makes it interesting for a range of potential quantum applications. The structure and properties of tungsten ditelluride have already been modulated using doping, strain engineering, and the application of electrical fields. And in this work, I will show you how lithium ion insertion into this interlayer gap um, can drive modifications of the structure and the properties. So now that I've shown you the material system, let's come to the experimental platform. So our platform consists of two electrodes, one of which is the lithium reservoir, and the other one is our material tungsten ditelluride. And in between, we have an electrolyte which only conducts lithium ions and no electrons. And we can um, use an external circuit, electrical circuit, to control that an electron moves over from the left side to the right side. And now we have a negative charge over here, 
which drives ionic motion. So a lithium ion will now follow from left to right. And we can count how many electrons we're sending through the external circuit. And from this, we can deduce exactly how many ions we have inserted into our material. So with this, we have a control over the stoichiometry of the material, which gives us control over all the material properties that depend on it. So this platform, we wanted to implement for single flakes of tungsten diterrorite. And this I've done by designing this um, on-chip plat electrochemical platform. So we have a tungsten diterrorite flake stamped on this current collector. And then we have lithium metal stamped on the other current collector, which is the source of lithium ions. And then I apply an electrolyte on top, which allows ionic flow between these two electrodes. And then we can close the electrical circuit and we can control exactly how many lithium ions are flowing in and out of the Van der Waals gap. Due to the use of lithium, this is highly air sensitive. And therefore, um, I built this sealed cell which can house this chip. And this allows me to bring it, to bring the system to all kinds of experimental setups. So this allows me to look at single flakes of tungsten diterrorite as opposed to looking at ensembles of millions of particles as well. Um, so, yes. um, so with this platform, um, I can look at the electrochemical signature of tungsten diterrorite as lithium is into it. Um, okay, so um, let's look at the electrochemical signature. Um, um, of tungsten diterrorite. And one way we can do this is called um, cyclic voltammetry. So here, what we are doing is we're applying a voltage between um, the lithium reservoir and our material. And um, we sweep this voltage. And at a certain threshold voltage, suddenly we measure large currents in our electrochemical cell. And these negative currents correspond to lithium and electrons moving from the lithium reservoir to our material. And then as we sweep the voltage back, um, we measure a positive current, which corresponds to the reverse reaction, lithium going out of our material again, back into the reservoir. So these peaks in cyclic voltammetry are, are a signature of a first order phase transition. So the data that I've shown you is actually from a coin cell where we look at bulk tungsten diterrorite, so many, many particles um, to get the electrochemical signature. However, um, I can look as well at single flakes of tungsten diterrorite on the platform that I showed you before. And actually the signature is exactly the same, albeit the currents that we measure are 1000 times lower. So this demonstrates that we have single flake electrochemical control over the ion insertion and also reversibility. So now that we have this working system, we can look at how does the flake evolve um, as lithium is being inserted in it. So let's look at these optical images. So you can see during lithium insertion, um, part the flake turns black and that black front is moving in from top and bottom, which corresponds to the in-plane A axis of the crystal, which will become important later on. So you can see the whole flake is becoming black. So this is a proof that the ion insertion in the single 
flake system is working. So in my work, I'm using two different iron insertion platforms. So the first one I showed you already, it's based on liquid electrolyte. It has the advantages of simple assembly and the liquid electrolyte has very high conductivities. However, it can be a disadvantage that the liquid electrolyte is covering the entire flake. Because for example, if we come in with a laser beam to study this material, the laser beam will have to go through the electrolyte, which will give us noise in our experimental signal. And um, the electrolyte might also degrade. So for this purpose, I also built an all solid cell where we use solid electrolyte instead, which is spatially confined such that most of the flake is not covered by anything. This makes this platform also vacuum compatible. And another thing is that here we can back edge um, the chip on which um, the flake is such that the flake is only sitting on a 50 nanometer thick um, membrane. So this allows, for example, for laser transmission experiments that are unperturbed. So now that I've shown you the experimental platform, I'd like to come to the phase transition that I already alluded to because we saw some signature of it in the electrochemistry. So for this, I'm using a technique called single crystal X-ray diffraction. This technique allows the investigation of the crystal structure of single crystalline particles. So for this, I'm using um, synchrotron X-ray radiation. So it's essentially, we use a 100 meter diameter electron accelerator, which then generates X-rays, which then come out of this tube. And then they hit our individual tiny tungsten diterrite flake, which is located in this holder over here. Here's the side view of the system. So the X-rays come out of this tube and hit the sample, which is hidden over here. And then these X-rays um, diffract off our sample. So they get scattered. And we have this detector, which captures the scattering. So this diffraction pattern. So an example of such a diffraction pattern is shown over here. So by analyzing where are peaks in this diffraction pattern, um, we can learn about the lattice parameters and the symmetry of the material that's being studied. But we can also look at the peak intensities. And from these, we can learn where exactly in the unit cell are our atoms located. So by using this technique, we can get these electron density maps of the tungsten diterrorite unit cell where the bright areas correspond to where the atoms are sitting. Using this technique, as well as bulk powder X-ray diffraction, as well as density functional theory, we confirm the structure of the new phase that's being induced by lithium ion insertion. So this is, it turns out it's a structure that has never been observed before. And therefore, we call it the TD prime polytype. So as the material transitions to this novel structure, um, we have a large scale out of plane expansion by 6%, which you can imagine as you put ions in between the layers, they will expand. But much more interestingly, we also have a 5% in plane expansion, but only along one of the in plane directions not along the other. So if we look at more detail at just one of these monolayers, so let's look from the top at one of those. So in the pristine material where no lithium has been inserted, we have these tungsten chains that I mentioned previously. However, after lithium insertion, these chains actually break up into clusters of four. Also, you can see that the material changes from an orthorhombic unit cell to a monoclinic unit cell. 
we can now also look at the side view of this structure. And in the pristine material with no lithium, this is the structure. And after lithium insertion, we see an interlayer slide of the layers. And we can also see in this depiction that the lithium ions are sitting in the Van der Waals gap in tetrahedral sites. So we have discovered this new structure. And what I've shown you here is just a static pic picture at a certain lithium content. However, um, we are also interested in studying how does the material get to that new structure. So for this, we turn to in situ single crystal X-ray diffraction. So we can look at how is this diffraction pattern um, evolving while lithium is being inserted into the material. So this is a video and I want to um, direct your attention to these two peaks, which will be disappearing. They correspond to the initial phase. And then new peaks will be appearing that correspond to the new phase. So let's look at this structural evolution. So you can see new peaks appearing over here and the initial peaks disappearing. So this proves that, if, that there's a first order phase transition happening because the first structure is disappearing at the expense of another structure that's appearing. We can now also look at the lithium ion removal. So we start out with the same diffraction pattern and now you'll be able to see these peaks shift, um, become weaker, and the initial peaks to reappear. So this shows through in situ X-ray diffraction that the ion insertion is a reversible process. So now I've shown you how the material transitions to the new phase. Now I want to come to how can we tune the structure of that new TD prime phase. So for this, I'm using um, the data of multiple diffraction peaks. So what I can do is I can look at multiple diffraction peaks for the initial structure and multiple diffraction peaks of the new structure. And I can look at their relative intensities and this informs um, the ratio of the two phases in the volume of the sample. So then I can plot the fraction of the new phase as a function of the overall volume of the flake as we're inserting more and more lithium into the material. So you can see that the phase fraction is increasing linearly until we reach a composition where the X in this formula is 0.42. At that point, the whole sample is in the new TD prime phase. And then by looking at the positions of the bracket, of, of the reflections, um, we can also learn about the unit cell parameters of the sample. So here I'm de depicting by how much these parameters are larger in the TD prime phase compared to pristine tungsten detaterite. So you can see while um, we are in this two phase regime where one phase is growing at the expense of the other, the lattice parameters in the new phase are constant. However, um, once we have 100% of the TD prime phase, we can still insert more lithium and in this solid solution regime, um, we actually see dramatic changes to the lattice parameters, especially the in-plane A-axis lattice parameter, which is changing by 1.4%, while the other in-plane direction, the B-axis, is almost not changing at all. So this means we have a uniaxial in-plane strain. And I want to guide your attention to how little lithium insertion is actually needed 
to drive this 1.4% in-plane strain. And also the voltage range that we have to apply in our electrochemical system is only 150 millivolt to achieve this. So this made me curious to what is actually the chemical expansion coefficient in the solid solution, because it seems to be very large. So the chemical expansion coefficient is the alpha in this equation over here, which is essentially the proportionality constant, constant between the volumetric concentration of inserted lithium and the resultant strain. So here are the chemical expansion, the in-plane chemical expansion coefficient for a, a range of prominent lithium insertion materials. And you can see the expansion coefficient in one in-plane direction on the x-axis and in the other in-plane direction on the y-axis. And you can see that all these materials are in this area over here. And most of them actually line up on this 35 degree angled line, which corresponds to in-plane isotropy, which means that the expansion in all in-plane directions is the same as lithium is being inserted. If we look at tungsten diterrorite, however, um, this chemical expansion coefficient is much larger and it's extremely anisotropic. Also, we were able to confirm this large expansion coefficient using dense density functional theory. So this is really exciting because this shows we can actually do highly efficient electrochemical actuation because we need only so little lithium to achieve such great expansion. And looking at this anisotropy, you can see that if you have a tungsten diterrorite flake that's stamped onto a substrate, that's adhering to a substrate, actually um, there will be a lot of rippling as lithium is inducing this expansion. So with this on structure switching, I want to come to vibrational switching. So this is a depiction of tungsten diterrorite. And we can launch a laser pulse that hits tungsten diterrorite. And it turns out this laser pulse excites an in-plane shear mode in the material. And this shear mode is very interesting because actually the crystal symmetry of the material is switched as the material is shearing between a structure where we have inversion symmetry and a structure where we don't have inversion symmetry. And this symmetry is linked to all the topological quantum properties. So this vibration is actually an ultra-fast topological switch. So I want to understand how does this vibration change as we insert lithium into the Van der Waals gap between the layers. So for this, I turn to a technique called ultra-fast electron diffraction. So we have our tungsten diterrorite sample located over here, and we can shoot a laser pulse on this material to launch that vibration. And then at a well-defined time delay, we can shoot an electron pulse through the material. The electron pulse will interact with the atoms and diffract off them. And we can collect a diffraction pattern that informs the crystal structure of the material. So we can control the time delay between the laser pulse and the electron pulse to map out on ultra short time scales how is the structure of the material evolving. So first of all, um, this is the static diffraction pattern we find in this ultra fast electron diffraction system for tungsten diterrorite prior to lithium insertion. After lithium insertion, which we are doing in situ while electrons are hitting the material, um, we can see that the structure, that the diffraction pattern is fully transformed, which corresponds to the new TD prime phase. Um, so this in situ electrode driven 
electrochemically driven phase transition is the first time such electrochemistry has been um, shown to work in an ultra, ultra fast electron diffraction system. Um, however, these are static diffraction patterns. So what happens to each of these patterns when we actually use the laser pulse to excite the material? So for this, we can look at a, a particular diffraction peak. So we can, for example, pick this one, which is equivalent to this one in the TD prime structure. Um, and for the pristine structure first, we can look at how is that the intensity of that reflection changing after the laser pulse excitation. So this intensity of that Bragg reflection is shown over here um, as a function of time on ultra short time scales after the laser excitation that occurs at time zero. So you can see that the intensity actually oscillates by a large, um, large, large margin after that excitation. And that corresponds to that shear mode that I've shown you before. So this is for the pristine tungsten dieterite sample. How does that look like for the fully lithiated sample? So actually we find that our laser pulse is no longer able to excite that type of shear mode in the fully lithiated sample. If we look at intermediate lithium concentrations going from dark colors to brighter colors to more lithiation, um, we can see that the more lithium we insert, the more this vibration is reduced in amplitude. So we can deduce, or this indicates that there might be a reduction in the electron phonon coupling, which is necessary for the laser pulse to be able to drive um, this vibration. So with this, I've shown you how we can, on an atomic time and atomic length scale, um, look at a particular vibration and how it's being changed by lithiation. However, um, we can use another technique to look at multiple vibrations at a time without like the specific um, atomistic details. So this technique is called Raman spectroscopy. And in this Raman spectrum, each peak corresponds to a lattice vibration. So here the Raman spectrum is shown for tungsten dieterite with no lithium inserted. How does that um, spectrum evolve um, with lithiation? So for this, I want to turn your attention to two particular um, peaks. And you can see with lithiation, both of these peaks are disappearing. So we see a vastly changed Raman spectrum due to lithium insertion. And after lithiation, we can use our electrochemical platform to remove the lithium again. And we can see that as we remove the lithium, actually these peaks reappear. And we can do the same thing for a second cycle of lithiation and delithiation. And we can see that we have full reversibility of the Raman spectrum with lithiation. So with this, you can see that lithium insertion can tune the vibrational spectrum reversibly, which has implications for the thermal properties of this material. So now I'd like to turn to the final section of my talk, which is on the ion insertion kinetics. So this is really important because only if the ion insertion kinetics are fast enough, um, can we actually use all these changes for dynamical switching because only then can we switch the material fast enough. So I suspected fast transport along the A in-plane axis of tungsten dieterite, because um, if you remember the optical video from the beginning, um, the phase transition was occurring in the direction of the A axis of the crystal. And looking at the atomic structure of TD prime tungsten dieterite, um, we can actually see that there are sort of 
channels in this van der Waals gap in which the lithium ions are sitting. And in these channels, the tetrahedral sites in which the lithium is sitting are actually 17% larger than the tetrahedral sites outside of these channels. So this suggests that the, um, the transport in the, along the A-axis might be really fast. So we used notched elastic band density functional theory calculations to confirm that hypothesis. So in this technique, um, we map out or, or we, we look at the energy um, path, the energy diagram along the path of uh, ionic hop. Um, so the hopping that we see over, over here is, for example, we see the, the lithium ion hopping from one side to the other, shown by this arrow. And also, um, you can see that hop in the top view of the structure. And then um, the energy um, that has to be overcome to make this hop in the A-axis direction is roughly 0 0.6 electron volt. Now we can also do the same analysis in the other in-plane direction, which is the B-axis. So here um, we have a hop that's occurring along this pathway. And when we use density functional theory to map out the energy along each of these steps, um, we find this type of diagram. And you can see that actually the barrier for the hop is now 1.4 electron volt, which is dramatically larger than along the A-axis direction. So this confirms that the ionic hop in the A-axis direction is way is strongly favored over the B-axis direction hop. So then I, with this, I wanted to know how fast can we actually switch this material? So for this, I turned to an experiment where um, I again used this liquid cell platform and I am applying a sinusoidal voltage um, between the two electrodes. And I choose the voltage in such a way that in half of the voltage range, lithium is being removed. And in half of the voltage range, lithium is being inserted. So as I'm changing the voltage, you can see lithium ions will go in and out of the structure. And then I can use x-rays to actually look at this, this edge of the, of the sample um, and see how it is evolving over time using x-ray diffraction. And you can actually see that a fast structure res response follows the fast electrochemical signal that we're feeding into the system. So from these diffraction patterns, we can of course deduce the structure of the material. So here I'm looking at the A-axis lattice parameter and you can see if I have a 50 millihertz signal, you can see the structure can follow, um, the lattice is following that signal. And the same can be said also for one hertz, um, which you can see more easily in the frequency domain. So for example, for um, electrochemical signals of one hertz, we see this peak in the Fourier transform at one hertz. And we actually also see a peak even for excitations of four hertz. So with this, we see that um, close to the edge, we can actually drive the system on very fast timescales. So I wanted to quantify the transport properties a little bit uh, further. So for this, I turn to a potential step measurement. So instead of the sinusoidal voltage um, change, I will use a potential step and this will cause fast lithiation or fast deliphiation. So again, we have the voltage shown over here, and there will be a range of voltages where lithium is removed and a range of voltages where lithium is inserted. 
And the potential profile that we choose is one where lithium is going out of the system. So lithium is completely depleted. And then we step to a voltage where lithium gets inserted. And then we look at how is the structure evolving over time. Um, again, using X-ray diffraction. However, now we're looking at the entire flake, not just the edge. So what we're measuring is a vol volume average over the entire flake. So from this diffraction, I can um, deduce the A-axis lattice parameter. And you can see that after the step of the voltage, um, that A-axis lattice parameter is evolving quickly from this one edge state to the other edge state. And within roughly 10 minutes, um, that transition is completed. And this is, this is actually extremely fast considering our flake has a lateral dimension of 350 micrometers. And I can show the same thing for the deleviation, which is a very similar curve. So with this data, um, I can actually use this as an input to calculate the diffusion coefficient. So what we know is that the A-axis lattice response, which is measured over here, is directly proportional to the lithium concentration in tungsten diterrorite. So due to this, we can actually switch this y-axis from the A-axis lattice parameter to the lithium concentration, the average lithium concentration in the whole flake. And the curve looks, in, looks the same. Um, so with this concentration over time profile, um, we can use that to simulate the fusion um, using the finite difference method. So the initial and boundary conditions are chosen to are chosen in a way that um, the lithium concentration is all, always fixed at its maximum level on the edges of the flake. This is because the electrochemical potential is such that lithium insertion is strongly favored. And the initial condition is that at time zero, the lithium concentration is at its minimum level everywhere else. So with this simulation, I can, um, I can completely replicate the experimentally seen concentration profile. So the simulation is shown in black over here, and the data is shown in red. So from this simulation, I can extract the diffusion coefficient of lithium in TD prime tungsten diterrorite. And that diffusion coefficient is eight times 10 to the minus seven centimeters squared per second. So what does that actually mean? How does it compare to related materials? Well, if we look at the two most common cathode materials in lithium ion batteries, actually you can see that their diffusion coefficient is six orders of magnitude slower. So what we found is an extremely fast um, diffusion coefficient, which makes this a useful system for fast dynamical switching if we only use flakes that have a small lateral size. So this concludes the main sections of my talk. Um, so I've shown you that I have this single flake on chip electrochemical system with which I can control lithium ion flow in and out of tungsten diterrorite flakes. I've shown you that in tungsten diterrorite, we see an interesting phase transition due to lithium insertion, which leads to an exotic atomic arrangement with these clusters of four tungsten atoms. I've shown you that this TD prime phase can be tuned by changing its lithium concentration in such a way that very small changes in the lithium concentration lead to dramatic in-plane expansions. 
Then I've also shown you how lithium ion insertion in tungsten diterrite dramatically changes the vibrational spectrum and how we can reversibly tune the spectrum. And finally, I've talked about the kinetics of ion insertion, which are extremely fast due to these channels on the atomic scale. So potential applications of tungsten diterrite with lithium insertion are in the field of actuation. Um, we can use <clears throat> this property for strain engineering of 2D materials. So what you can do is you can take one 2D material and you could stack another 2D material on top of it. And as one of them will um, be strained, that strain will be transferred to the other one. So the uniaxial in-plane strain that we are observing can break crystal symmetries of the other material that's stacked on top of it. And this symmetry breaking could be used as a topological switch um, to switch the quantum properties of topological materials. Also, the strain modulation in that type of system tunes the electric band structures of 2D materials. And that type of tuning could be done at kilohertz device operation if only the tungsten diterrite flake is scaled in a way that's smaller than 300 nanometers laterally. This comes from the fast diffusion coefficient in the system. Also in the field of actuation, um, we could use tungsten diterrite nanowires as artificial muscles. We could also use tungsten diterrite flakes or nanowires as one-dimensional lithium conduction channels due to the fast transport properties in this A-axis in-plane direction. From my work, there are also several potential scientific opportunities for the future. Um, first of all, this new TD prime polytype um, has not been explored before, so there's still a lot of physics that could be studied, for example, its optical properties. Furthermore, um, with the system that I've shown you, we can study the ionic hopping mechanism on an atomistic level by doing pump probe spectroscopy. And further, all the techniques that were developed for this work can also be applied to other 2D systems. So this marks the end of my talk. Um, I'd like to welcome any questions. And after the questions, um, there will be a separate acknowledgement section. Thank you for your attention. Hey, can, can I just jump in with a question? Thank you for the, the talk, Philip. Um, I wanted to ask a question regarding uh, the simulation for finding the diffusion coefficient. Uh, isn't there a bit of a chicken and egg scenario here because you needed the diffusion coefficient in order to do the simulations. Um, and then I, once you have a diffusion coefficient, I can, I can see how you would get the experiment to uh, line up with the um, with the simulation, but how would you do that before you have the coefficient? Yeah, thanks for the great question, Shaked. So um, the diffusion coefficient is essentially the main unknown um, in the system. So I know, for example, all the all the the time profile from the experiment, and I know um, the you know the the spatial profile um, from essentially the flake that we're using. And the unknown is really the diffusion coefficient. So the way I operated it is actually, I run the simulation at different diffusion coefficients, and then I see which diffusion coefficient lines up with the experimental result. So that's, that's, that's how I got that. So it's an iterative um, regime, essentially. Does that you, answer your you, question? I assume you did some kind of binary search you kind of in increased it if you saw that it was too low and decreased it if you saw that it was too high and ended up kind of. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you.
Hey, Philip. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yeah. What just happened? <laughs> Did the, the meeting ended or? Wait, what? I don't know. If... Ah. I think everything's still fine, is it? Apologies, sorry, my, my, my mistake. Continue. Please continue. <laughs> yeah, are there any other questions? Um, feel free to also use the, the chat um, if, if you prefer that. Hey, Philip, this is Anadeep. Um, Hi. It's a great talk. Uh, it was really great to hear uh, about your work. I had a quick question about so the disappearance of that share mode that uh, you talked about towards the middle of your talk. Is there evidence that the frequency shifted like very far outside? I mean, I, I suppose you did a direct time domain measurement, but is there a possibility that that mode combined with other modes or changed in other, in other ways? Um, do you have an idea of what kind of change happened to the overall profile of, of vibrational modes? Yeah, thanks for that question, Anudeep. So with the technique of ultra-fast electron uh, diffraction, we would actually be able to pick up, um, I mean, it would have to be a dramatic frequency shift so that in that time frame that we measured and with that sampling rate that we used, um, it would not show up as an oscillation anymore. Um, so it seems more likely that um, the excitation mechanism of that shear mode is actually broken due to lithium insertion. And it is the case that like, this is not a resonant um, excitation of the mode. So we're using a high energy laser um, to, to excite this mode. So it's sort of a special um, case that that mode can actually be excited outside of resonance. So that's a special case in pristine tungsten detaryte. So it seems more likely that lithium is sort of disturbing um, that excitation mechanism. Does that make sense? Yeah, so yeah, that, that does make sense. So, so, I mean, would it be an alley? You're basically adding some sort of friction to this kind of shear mode. Um, that's the kind of intuition that I have for it anyway. Yeah, that, that could be one way, one way to think about it. Um, but it, it could also be just the electron phonon coupling um, changing. Mm -hmm. Right. Great, thank you. Uh, Philip, if I may ask a question, uh, as you had just been talking about electron phonon coupling, actually, great talk. I really enjoyed it. Good to see you again. You. Um, on your transparency number 31, you had shown how, how the oscillation actually was kind of like damped off depending on how you dope it with, with lithium. And you were uh, interpreting that, or you at least said that that would or could be due to electron phonon coupling. And the question is, on the other hand side, your, your later on shown Raman spectra showed that it's basically the phonon spectrum itself that somehow changed. So how could you actually distinguish between a change in electron phonon coupling, which could be interesting uh, due to a certain relation eventually to, to topological properties or so, and uh, the phonon spectrum itself? Is there mm -hmm. any... Is, is it just a guess or is there a way to, to, to distinguish or is it just these two different types of possibilities that you have? Yeah, thanks for the great question. Um, I, think, I think one way to distinguish it could be um, to change the excitation mechanism um, between a resonant and non-resonant excitation mechanism. So, so that would be that would be one idea. So this this vibration is taking place in the um, in the terahertz range. So we could sort of do a terahertz excitation and see if then we're able to excite that mode. Yeah, that would be my idea. Okay. Thanks anyway. Yeah. Good to see you, Bern. Any more questions? Is 
there any any other questions um can also use the chat Okay, so if there are no more questions, uh, maybe I'll come to the acknowledgement section. Um, so first of all, um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the defense committee. Um, thank you all um, for taking out the time out of your busy schedule um, to be here. And um, I'd like to start by thanking Aaron and Will, which are my two uh, PhD advisors. Um, so I'm really so fortunate to have done all my work um, with the two of you. Um, you're two of the most driven and motivated individuals that I've, that I've ever met. And your research is so rigorous and you have so much interest in your graduate students. You're so generous with your time and extremely supportive and kind. So I really thank you for that. And like one illustration that came to mind that describes both of you is someday in my um, first year um, at Stanford, um, I think I went to bed at around midnight and I woke up at around 8 a.m. And when I wake up, I saw Will had sent an email around midnight to Aaron and me and then around 5.30, Aaron had written a detailed response to that email. And when I woke up, like all that conversation had already happened. So I think that really shows how incredible, uh, how incredibly driven and motivated and helpful you are. Like with these many similarities between Aaron and Will, um, there are also some things that individually stand out for me. So for Aaron, these are like the record fast responses to any questions or hours long discussions or even like hands-on help in the lab, which I'm really grateful for. So there was a time where Aaron was convinced that a talk that I was gonna give at MRS conference would get one order of magnitude better if we do a certain experiment in the lab. So he was with me in the lab on the Saturday before the conference, and we were trying to get that experiment to work. And as he didn't know, it was my birthday. So at some point I said I needed to go. And then Aaron still continued, I think for one more hour to trying to figure our problem out. So that's really such a unique experience. And I'm really grateful for that. And then for Will, I think Will is one of the most structured thinkers I've ever met. So he manages a lab of 40 people and I think has cultivated one of the best group cultures in all of Stanford. Um, I'm really grateful for all the social activities that he's encouraging and you know, doing so much um, to sort of think about the social aspects when you think about work. So really thankful for that, Will. So it's, it's really amazing to spend five years of my life working with two such amazing people. Um, and then coming to Evan. So Evan, I met you first in classes. So about atomic arrangements and about computer simulations, which really were so well taught and became so important for my future research. So I'm really thankful for that teaching style and then you came on into this project as a collaborator. Um, and you were really instrumental to interpreting all the density functional theory results and understanding the limits. So I'm really thankful for your help here and also really thankful for agreeing to be a reader of my dissertation. And then I'm also really grateful to Eric Pop, who is the chair of this PhD defense. So actually when I came to Stanford, I don't know if you remember, but I emailed you that I wanted to join your group and um, it, it, it was not possible, but um, I'm really 
grateful that you're now here on my PhD defense and we can sort of um, close that cycle in a way. Um, also really grateful for you to be willing to chair this defense. And then Andy Mannix, um, we have not interacted too much, but I really appreciated um, how you were immediately willing to be on this defense committee, how you were so responsive. And I really look forward to the discussions we will have in the closed session. So of course the work would also not be possible without research facilities and funding sources. So a lot of the research was done at Stanford in facilities such as the nanofabrication facility um, and the nano shared facilities. But a lot of the work was also done at national labs, especially Slack. And at Slack, especially the synchrotron has been instrumental to getting all that um, X-ray data that I showed you. And the electron diffraction um, was done at the ultra-fast electron diffraction facility, which is part of LCLS at Slack. And the funding for all this work comes mainly from the Department of Energy um, Office of Science. So thank you to them. Of course, <clears throat> all of this work would never be possible without my great collaborators and mentors. So Danny has actually carried out all of the density functional theory collaborate, uh, um, calculations, and I'm really grateful for all the great discussions that we had. Yang has helped me start this entire project and has been really instrumental to um, getting all of that started. Um, Aditya has been really instrumental to sort of getting work done, but also interpreting um, the results and finding interesting research directions and has been just such a huge pillar of support. And I'm really grateful for, for that. Andre has also always been there with support and always available for really detailed and helpful scientific discussions. So thank you for that. Um, Kipil has helped me make sense of X-ray diffraction and how we can use it to understand structures. And then there are many more people who have contributed with really helpful discussions um, and, and really um, you know, helped sort of help to make this all happen. So I'm really grateful to all these people um, who have been there for me. Then I also want to acknowledge the administrative support with, with which um, this all also would not have been possible. So thanks to Mara, Annie, Corinna, Margo and Chris. And then I want to explicitly thank the Lindenberg group. So if you look at the writing on the wall, you can see that these folks, they, they really got my back. So it's been really, really great to work with all of you. And I really enjoyed all our outdoor excursions, our excursions to conferences, to arcade, arcade halls, and even an excursion to eat Indian food in Germany. I'm also really grateful for the Chu group. So the people in the Chu group are always so su supportive, always up for discussions. And it's just really inspiring. These are people who go after some of the most important challenges that the world is facing right now. I really enjoyed um, all our outings for barbecues, for hikes, and even to weddings. I also want to explicitly thank all the people who were there to shape the beam time experiences for me. So these are experiences that I'll truly never forget. I also like to think, uh, thank my previous mentors. So Berendt who's on the call here um, has really shaped how, how I do science at the early stage then Giovanni and Berndt have sort of brought me out in the world, right? To leave Germany, to go to other places to do science. And then in these other places, I also met great mentors who have really been instrumental to getting me to where I am today. 
Also, of course, my friends were absolutely central to getting through this time. So I might have forgotten some of you, but you know who you are and thank you so much. I appreciate you a lot. And I also found a home in Palo Alto, which was really instrumental to grounding me and you know, supporting me throughout this entire process. So thank you to all of you. And then I'd also like to thank my family who has been a constant support. My parents have shown me the importance of education and that was really, really helpful. So my dad is actually an electrochemist who's always up to talk about electrochemical questions with me and other science questions. And my mom is an English teacher who always, you know, I'm living in the English speaking world. So it's been really instrumental to get the language right as well. And then I'd also like to thank my sister for all our conversations and for really keeping me grounded. And finally, um, I've shown you all these people that have been mentors to me that have, you know, got me where I am. And I'm also really grateful that I've been to some extent been able to give back as well. So Felipe, Feyu and Aditi have worked very closely in the lab with me and are now taking all these techniques to the next level. So really grateful for that opportunity as well. Um, so this, this marks the end of my talk. Thank you all for being here. Thank you very much, Philip. So I guess we the the rest of the committee will join at the at the other Zoom link that that was sent around. Yes, that's Thanks right. Thanks everyone for joining.